Welcome in to the m M&M and Discipleship Podcast, where we discuss what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We aim to look for God in our daily lives, be in His Word, and strive to live out the teachings of Jesus. This is Michael Round. This is my co-host, Dakota Moody. Dakota, how is it going this fine morning? It's an excellent morning. It's uh, always an excellent morning when we are uh, serving God with our lives, and uh, it is another wonderful morning. Uh, so we've got temperatures raising up a little bit, which is good, but you know, the biggest part for me is that our AC got fixed because our AC was not working, um, and I'm glad that it happened in the spring rather than summer. Um, it was a little bit unbearable in the house because it got into like the 80s for a couple of days, and that's right when it went out, um, which was not ideal, and so it was like you know, 84 in the house, um, which is never comfortable. But you know what? I'll take that any day over experiencing it in the summertime when it could have gotten into the 90s. Um, But it also amazes me because I grew up in a house without air conditioning. And I just think to myself, how did I do that? I don't understand (laughs) how I was able to do that so effectively. I mean, it was a very small house. And, you know, I'll say temperate, very temperate climate in West North Carolina. But I look back and I think to myself, like, how did I get through that well even better is the fact that you don't own your house so you're not paying for the hvac fix (laughs) yes yes i just make a call and the guy shows up and he leaves and i don't have to pay him anything it's a beautiful thing yeah it's a beautiful thing now i also have no equity um and i'm paying somebody else (laughs) but there are some real advantages to renting where all i got to do is call and somebody else's uh, somebody else takes care of the bill. That is a very nice thing. <laughs> so interestingly enough, I don't know how much this interests a lot of people, but um, on Twitter, I see a lot of, um, they're not, they're like pseudo financial advisors, advisors, mm-hmm. and they talk about how they rent, like they're extremely wealthy, but they rent because they would so much rather not have to deal with the headache of all those kinds of things happening. Uh, and they think that it's a decent uh, it, it can be a decent return to rent. Of course, they're investing a lot of the difference in what they're what they would be spending on those, you know, sunk costs. But you know, I, I don't know that I fully buy into that. You know, I, I'm very much for home ownership, but uh, th- it's interesting that there is kind of a counter movement or people that think differently on that. Well, I think it's just about sustainability, right? Because like, if you, if you're talking about the short term, sure, yeah. like renting is nice if you have an idea of like living in a space for like three to five years max, right? Like, yeah, but it does not make sense if you're planning on like planting your life in an area for 20 plus years. Like it doesn't think that that, then it would not make sense. I don't think now, you know, but each, each person has their own ideas. And I will say as well, um, it's home ownership has gotten more expensive than it has ever been based on the fact that like, you know, if you want to, if, if you, your AC unit goes out and you got a new one, like you're talking about like 15 to 20 grand, potentially you could be forking out. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Very instant. And it didn't, you know, it hasn't always been that way. Uh, the expensive cost for these sorts of things. So I think it's debatable, and, and, but. And things don't last as long like, like they used to. I mean, used to, you, you pay for something and it would last 20 years or whatever. I mean, in South Carolina, our hot water heater, I think was from 1999 or something like that. And it was an amazing hot water heater. Yeah. We always had like hot water quickly. Mm. Um, you know, things aren't made like that anymore. Back uh, in so my there, day, that. things used That's... to be made very well. Yeah. yeah. We started talking about the weather. Or the... <laughs> How old do we sound right now? Yeah. I know. I know. But anyway, so it, and, and two, it depends upon your context. Like if you're living in a city, mm-hmm. uh, renting would, would make more sense uh, yeah. in that area. But you know, just a heads up, Dakota, Normie, we're not uh, able to provide any professional advice in that area. But anyways, don't, if you're don't interested, listen to us. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of YouTubers and people out there that are promoting the renting lifestyle. So that's right. There's sure. some perks to it. Yes, but if if you if you uh, if you subscribe to the Dave Dave Ramsey School, of thinking though he would uh, he would yell at both of us right now and call us stupid oh, idiots. Yeah. Um, well, no, I mean, no, because he, it, I mean, you, you conceded that renting for a time is good and he's all about that too. He says, uh-huh. if you have debt, you shouldn't own a house. You should not um, own a house. Well, good. Until you I are have, able, I have, until you're able to put 20% down and get a 15 year fixed rate mortgage that is not more than 25% of your monthly take on pay. Mm-hmm. So it's like, he is very specific on encouraging people to rent because of those costs that come up 
that if you're broke, you don't have any money to pay for, and then you go into further debt. Yeah. So. Well, then maybe he wouldn't be as as as, as uh, yell at me as much. Now, he would yell at me for many other things, probably. Um. But yeah. He, he wouldn't yeah. yell at me for that because I am in debt. So there you go. Um. But there's there is another. Yeah, yeah. One last thing on that. There's a book. Oh man, I cannot remember it. Um, it's by Chris Hogan. It's somebody that mm-hmm. was a Ramsey personality and no longer is, but they studied a whole bunch of millionaires. I think it was ten thousand millionaires. Yeah. And how they got there, and it was really cool. I mean, they they followed either Ramsey's plan or something very similar to that. Um, but you know, most of their wealth was in real estate, um, in one way or another. They they came to own their home or whatever. Always so, is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, owning your home is is good for the long term. Yeah. And so I definitely I agree with that and acknowledge that. Because as they say, but I just you find know, it interesting again. They're always making more money. You can't make more dirt. So if as you if you own yeah. more property, own more things like that, like they can never you can't you can't ever make more land. You know, it's kind of we're kind of yeah. locked in on that amount. So to get that to that point, but uh, we don't have uh, I don't have that much of a luxury at this at that point. So we're just continuing on but you know what the lord has blessed me greatly and so there's no arguments on my my end and i know he will provide exactly and i know he'll provide greatly for me and all that i need and that's what the important thing is um and and speaking about what god does in our lives michael where have you seen god this week so it's been recently been over the last couple of weeks and months but i had lunch with dale jenkins um, a few weeks ago and something i asked him about things he's noticing across the church and things like that and one of the things he commented on is how the church is growing Mm. all over the place um churches of christ are getting younger and they're growing are two things he said Mm. and i see that and i've seen that in this past week i think he was in ohio uh and he posted a lot of pictures of his travels and things and the church that he was at had a full house i mean Mm. the church I, i don't know how big the church is but like they could barely fit 100 people in and they had standing room only at different points and wow. and just how exciting that is uh and so i see a revival and it's not with just within churches of christ there are different kinds of revivals going on on christian campuses and and things like that so i think there's a good undercurrent of of the spirit moving in in the lives of churches and and so that's exciting i'm seeing god work in that, those ways yeah, I've been seeing a lot of reports about um, even on secular college campuses, especially in the southeast. I've seen a lot of these like mass baptisms and things like that happening on these mm-hmm. college campuses. It's it's kind of interesting because I feel like um, there's been a general realization about how the church is not meeting the needs of the people of younger generations. And there has been people who have prioritized that. And I think it's changed the way a lot of uh a lot of congregations have done kind of their normal business. Not that they've, you know, given up biblical truths or something like that. Maybe some have in, in other groups and everything like that. But um, the focuses have changed in certain ways uh, to different realities than what it used to be. And and that's that's encouraging to hear that they're seeing that on a on a mass scale. That that somebody, um, especially uh, like Mr. Jenkins, has been working with as many churches as he does, um, sees all that is happening and and sees that that's happening more because i i've seen a little bit of that at different at different times different places but that's great to hear him report that it's happening in a lot of places and for those that don't know him he right now he and his brother both just serve preachers and they're they're trying to help churches on a larger scale they're independent from a specific church i mean they're members of a home church where they live but they travel all over the country and all over the world Uh, and so they they see literally hundreds of churches a year uh, so it's it's cool to to see uh, that that the church is growing. So what about you, man? Where where have you seen God recently? That's some very it's some very encouraging news to hear. As so many so many of us can be in the doom and gloom stage with where <clears throat> I guess general society's morality is going. That we can see um, a renewal in, in young people. That's always great. Um, as for myself, you know, um, we had church service here as we always do on Sunday mornings, and it was a, a wonderful occasion and. Something uh, kind of occurred this Sunday morning. It was a really great experience because we had one of our younger adults get up to lead the communion talk, and and in doing so, you know, he he was reflecting um, on his own his own walk as he's trying to think about how he's partaking in the communion service, 
and 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 how he's kind of doing in his own uh walk and and i think this is so important for us because he he's realized something that we all should whenever we go to the to the, the communion table when we partake in the lord's supper um as paul talks about in first corinthians we should be looking to um how we're living our lives it should be this weekly checkup as to how is my faith walk how am i doing in my walk with christ and and uh, this um this young man talked about how he realizes he's been struggling, but he's had things that God has reached out and helped him with to encourage him to build up his faith. And that was a great moment. But then afterwards, you know, after him pouring his heart out after this, in this communion talk, after the communion, um, the shepherds here, the congregation, the couple of the elders, you know, pulled him back up and, and prayed with him in front of the congregation. And mm. um, so often we can be so concerned about, well, we got to get out of here by 1130. We got to get this mm. done. Everything's got to be structured. If you want to share that, that's fine. But you know, it's, we can get so structured in our services that we can um, yeah. hamper the spirits moving in our congregation, uh, the spirit moving in our congregation and, and doing these sorts of things where we have these moments of reflection, these moments where um, we're seeing God work and that can happen so easily um, that we can we can miss out on some of these amazing moments where spirituality can just be flowing because we're so concerned about we got to get out of here at this time we got to get people mm. to lunch at this time we got to people <laughs> at home at this time and to have a moment like that it was it was special to see that and uh, I appreciate the elders that are here um, for recognizing that there was a need clearly at that moment um, to take it take a second take a pause <clears throat> and pray with this with this young man who had been who's led the communion talk and, and and poured his heart out in front of people and and I would say where I've seen God is in both of those ways not only one giving that young man a heart to share and mm. confess this before the congregation but secondly for the elders to say nothing else matters the time doesn't matter we need to pray with this man in front of the congregation and we can mm. all as a church family be there and support with him. Um, and it was a special moment. And I, and I, and I would encourage, um, more people within churches everywhere to think about the service is not a, a, a time, uh, that you have to begin here, end here, and that's the end of it. And if anything else, if, if the work of the spirit gets in the way, we can't mm -hmm. have that if we got to get the schedule. No, if the spirit moves and the spirit's working, that needs to be the priority. Well, and it, it it says something too about the health of your church. You know, if if emotion like that and mm. and transparency like that is never there, yeah. Um, I, mean, I cannot remember where I, I heard it or or read it from, but just the question of when was the last time someone cried at your church, mm. um, or how often do people cry at your church? And not in a, I mean, it may be in a, a sorrowful way, but it may be in a joyful way. You know, mm. do people show emotion? Um, they feel vulnerable uh, enough to, to show that. emotion. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, there's a comfort level, like you said, that they can feel vulnerable. But there's <clears> also, <throat> like you said, a spiritual component that, you know, is the spirit working through what we're saying and what we're doing? Uh, or are we just going through the motions? Right. So where our heart is at is in that. And and we can see that. But that's beautiful that that took place Sunday. And mm -hmm. certainly those are special moments um, in time. Well, speaking of special, we're going to look at a special passage today, uh, one that really is kind of at the heart of what we try and do here, and as well what the church should be about. Uh, and so we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 11 through 16, and I'm going to go ahead and read that. Uh, and this may be a familiar passage to you, it may not, uh, but I want you to see yourself in this passage from the standpoint of something that you should be called to do or should be involved in. Uh, and so if you're hearing this, be, be mindful of that. Ephesians 4.11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint 
with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So Dakota, where do you see um, the the everyday Christian, so to speak, that doesn't have a position of authority, uh, doesn't have a leadership position uh, in the official capacity, where do they fit in in this passage? Yeah, so as you kind of mentioned earlier, you know, this is a discipleship podcast and the goal for every Christian should be to become a disciple of Christ. That should be the goal of every Christian. And I think when we look at it, we would look at passage like this, maybe you don't find yourself in anything in that first verse, at verse 11. You don't see yourself, obviously, I wouldn't see myself as an apostle either, um, in, the, in the sense of like a title. Um, <laughs> right. And not necessarily a prophet either in the, in the traditional sense of the Old Testament, but, you know, an evangelist, not a shepherd at this point, obviously, but we have people who are shepherds. Um, and then there are many who teach, but maybe you are listening to this and you don't feel like you fit into any of those categories. Well, the goal for every congregation should be that there are people who fit these categories. There should be elders, there should be teachers, there should be evangelists who are working to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And if you are a Christian, you are a saint. Mm -hmm. And our goal in a podcast like this, in a church setting, in any setting, should be to build up every Christian to the point where your faith is no longer centered on you. Your faith is centered, of course, on God. But as well, your spiritual life isn't just a, just about the relationship between you and God. It's about how you can use it for others. To build up your faith to the point where it's not just about how you can survive spiritually, but how you can help and support others. I think of it kind of as the transition in a person's life from when um, they are working to try to take care of themselves financially, physically, all those things, to the point where they can be built up to take care of others, right? Mm. In the same sort of way, it should be our faith walk. Because when we're young in faith, um, it's going to take us some time to get our own house in order, right? To build up our relationship with God, to get those fundamentals down. But what every church and every Christian should be working towards is eventually getting to the point, as he talks about here, where we can do the work of ministry, where every mm -hmm. single Christian can share their faith with somebody else to either build up that other person's faith if they are already a member of the faith or to teach someone else about faith. Mm. And that is the goal and responsibility of every Christian. If you are a Christian and you don't want to help somebody else with their faith or tell somebody else about faith, then you are not a disciple of Christ. And that is, and that means that there needs to be growth. Yeah, yeah. One well, and, and interestingly enough, this passage outlines that church leadership's goal is to equip the saints, the Christians, for the work of ministry. This the 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 apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, church leadership, they're not the ones necessarily doing the work of ministry. They're doing the work of equipping the saints. Now they do do ministry because they're also <laughs> saints. Right. But a lot of times we have a mentality, and even as someone in church leadership, we don't have enough expectations for, of people. We allow people to just sit back and do nothing, yeah. whereas our goal should be equipping and putting the ball in people's court and, and letting them serve others. And really, that's what the word ministry is, it's service, serve others, help others. Uh, and we see that that next clause there for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. As Dakota pointed out, you should be looking and I should be looking for how we can help other people grow and help the church grow. What, what can I do to help contribute to the work of the church? And we do this until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature and of the fullness of Christ. Well, we're never going to fully measure up to that. And so we have a goal that we should continually be striving to do. We should be striving to become more and more mature to get further down that journey. And so we all have work to do. And the thing that's exciting with this is every church has new people. Every church has young Christians. Well, maybe not every church, but most churches have <laughs> younger Christians or less mature Christians. There are people that you can pour into 
There are people that just had a new baby. There are people that just got married. There are people that just got divorced. There are people that just went through this or that. There are people that you can minister to, that you can help. Uh, and so we should be looking for those people. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, it's it's either we need to always look to how if we can build ourselves up in faith to this point, and we're hopefully being built up by the people in the congregation, people like the ministers, people like the elders to be built up in faith to the point where we can look to help somebody else or look to share our faith within the world. And that needs to be that needs to be the primary goal. Our, our goal as Christians cannot just be, I call myself a Christian, I go to church, and that is the extent of my faith. Again, we've talked about this multiple times in the Discipleship Podcast. The goal of each and every Christian should be to become a disciple of Christ. And a disciple of Christ does not just come sit and leave and don't do anything else with their faith the rest of the week. Disciples... Well, Go ahead. No, I was just like to say to that end, like we are called saints and disciples overwhelmingly more than we are called Christians. The, wor yes. the word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament, whereas saints and disciples, they're used dozens, hundreds of times between those two words. Mm. And that should be the way that we think of ourselves. When we think about who we are, it should be disciples. It should be saints. Mm. And when we when we change the idea there uh, about what the nomenclature is that we call ourselves, it can change mm. the way we see everything at that point and about our responsibilities as Christians. So we think about this, we think about discipleship, let's think about what each of us can do, whether we're in one of those positions on the front, on, on that that first line, that verse 11, or to build up others to get to this point, or whether you are somebody who needs to be built up in this way, and you need to look to the people who are in these situations, hopefully in a good church that has people like this who can help you to be built up in this way. Yeah, yeah, and it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So practically speaking, think about how you can love on other people. Yep. People have needs. People uh, have uh, needs that are unmet. Mm -hmm. uh, people need encouragement. People need support. Uh, and we can do that by showing up. We can do that by calls, texts, uh, gifts, uh, ways to bless people spontaneously, food. I mean, there, there are any, any number of things. Yep. Identify some people that you can pour into. And the greatest act of love you can show is by sharing the gospel with them. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So let's, uh, we want to uh, finish this episode by talking about uh, what we've been reading recently. So I think we were both in the same books that we were in last week, just in some different portions of said books. Um, no, no, actually, no, no, your book changed, didn't it? Because yeah, I was I in, your book yeah. changed. yes, because you were in Tim Keller last week, and then I was in Tim mm -hmm. Keller last week, but I'm still in Tim Keller. You're back to uh, Mr. Stanley. So go ahead yes. and uh, go ahead and tell us where what you've been reading this week. Uh, quick thing before that, that Chris Hogan book I mentioned earlier, it's called mm -hmm. Everyday Millionaires. Again, mm -hmm. they studied a large number of millionaires the ramsey uh company and how they got there and yeah. i want to reiterate again i am in support of buying real estate i just find it interesting <laughs> that other people have other opinions out there uh but anyways that's another discussion for another day <laughs> I, I i'm yeah we've been reading uh, deep and wide by andy stanley it's what we're reading so i you know i was referencing mm -hmm. another book that's there out there that people could read <laughs> uh, he said on page 147 he talked about while the magnitude of what life brings our way changes our responses and our ability to rightly interpret those unforeseen changes in the landscape of our lives will always be critical to the health of our faith. And so we talked about how, you know, we all have things in life that happen to us mm -hmm. and how we interpret those is often more important than the events that actually happen. Uh, he referenced Steve Jobs and how Steve Jobs, when he was younger, when he was a preteen, witnessed poverty and he couldn't reconcile how a good God could allow people to be poor and hungry and thirsty. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas he talked to Stanley talked about how his kids went on a mission trip that were at the same age as Steve jobs. And they were inspired to help other people. And they uh, could clearly see that God was not okay with that, that, that God was trying to do our efforts and through things that God was doing to try and bless those people. And, and obviously the presence of sin and, and, leads to a lot of that. Um, so when it comes to personal life, when we all get sick, we all will die eventually. We all have loved mm -hmm. ones that pass. We all lose our jobs at one point or another or, or have some kind of trial. That's what he says. While the magnitude 
of what comes changes. Our response is what really matters, how we interpret those things. And so as Christians, we need to develop a biblical worldview, and that's what Stanley, Stanley points out. Uh, but we also need to see what God is doing in those circumstances uh, and allow God to show himself, reveal himself, and look to surround ourselves with others who have that same kind of worldview. Uh, so I thought that was special and in, in that we all have trials uh, and how we interpret those matters. Hmm. I mean, the truth is we're in a fallen world and we're going to see fallen things. Um, yes. But if you if you if you look to this, if you look to the sin and then say, God, why aren't you taking care of the sin? Rather than we let sin into the world, but God has solved the problem of sin. We just wait on the final solution, which is which has already been solved in Christ Jesus. We just wait for his return. And the reason why we continue to wait is that more and more God is waiting for more and more, more souls to come to him. Mm, and so, yes, absolutely. And so our our goal needs to be, our understanding needs to be in this way. When we see sin, God has solved the sin problem, right? Now, we don't we don't see the final solution yet, but it is coming. We are promised the final solution. And God waits to send that final solution until more and more souls come to him. So as long Absolutely. as we're here, back to our message earlier, we need to continue to gather souls for that time because that's what God's waiting for, mm. for, for more and more sons and daughters to come to him. And once that time comes, then when he sends his son, then sin will be no more and sin will die yeah. and that will be the final death. When this this understanding of priorities leads in well to what you're reading from the prodigal prophet. Yes, absolutely. And uh, how we how we see ourselves, how we see the world, I think, is is huge and very important to what um, to how how we see everything in life. Right. How we see things can change our entire perspective, as we just talked about. Right. You can be a, a glass half full person or a glass half empty person this way. Um, but also how you see yourself changes everything. We've seen a lot of this with issues with identity in the world. I don't want to go too deeply into that topic, but the way that people identify themselves nowadays change so much of how they view everything, um, whether that's from a gender standpoint or any other uh, anything else. But Tim Keller talking about Jonah and how he looked at himself, how he identified himself, especially with those around him, really shows his heart and why he uh, was so uh, res resistant to going to Nineveh, um, because when the sailors on the boat, when the storm is is causing the boat to uh, almost be destroyed right there in the middle of the ocean, um, they, they ask Jonah, trying to figure out who the God is that he serves, hey, Jonah, what do you do for a living? Where are you from? Uh, what's your background? And Jonah first says that he is a Hebrew, and then the second thing he says is, and I serve the Lord, of uh, the God of heaven, uh, the, who created the sea and the dry land. You notice the first thing he mentioned. He is a Hebrew, right? Mm. And then he serves God. Well, Tim Keller says in the Prodigal Prophet, talking about Jonah, obviously, he says, Jonah identified himself first ethnically, then religiously. And we may infer that his ethnicity is foremost in his self-identity. And I think that's fair whenever you see his life. God commanded him to do something, and he said, no, thank you, God. Instead, I'm going to resist you. Why? Because I hate those people, mm. and I am and my this nation. kind of person. Yes, my, my, I hate these people. My nation hates these people. They hate my nation. Therefore, I will not love them or go to them or preach repentance to them. When anything gets in the way of us having God first as our center— Everything else goes off kilt, and I don't have enough time to go into this, nor am I going to try to get as controversially as I could. Um, however, do, what is first in our identity? And I say this very important to 21st century American Christians, because as much as we want to wrap our, our Bible in our flag, what comes first? And that means how we deal with people we disagree with politically. That means how we deal with illegal immigrants. That means how we deal with uh, those who disagree with us from a religious standpoint. How do we treat them? How do we look at them? How do we see them? It's very mm -hmm. important for us to remember that. Our identity first needs to be 
children of God, who are just as much in need of a Savior as anyone else. That has got to be our first identity and our first priority. Absolutely. Disciple of Christ should be first on our identity list and Absolutely. who we are. And that's that's what we're about here uh, at this podcast. And, and we certainly hope that you are the same. We know with a lot of these things, um, we're preaching to the choir, so to speak. <laughs> um, but we appreciate you guys following along. We really thank you for, for listening and sharing this podcast. Um, I, I always enjoy uh, when when you guys reach out about things about the podcast. We really appreciate that you're listening. Uh, and we thank you for joining us on the m M&M Discipleship Podcast. Until next time, let's look for God, learn from His Word, and live out His teachings. Have a good one.